Hello, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to uh, Chinese University Hong Kong, the Graduate Law Center, um, on a session on to pocket or not pocket. Um, and we have a very distinguished panel today of uh, three legislative counselors who are all going to speak. And I'm sure you're much more interested in hearing what they have to say than what I have to say. But let me uh, give just a few introductory remarks. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Chinese University, Hong Kong here, and my area of interest is comparative public law and comparative constitutional change. So I've been asked to give just a very few, and I'll make them very brief, um, comments specifically on, the, on what some of the comparative elements of this uh, decision and in general the um, political reform in Hong Kong, uh, so some comparative perspectives. Now, We've had a lot of, I think, a lot of writing on the international law perspective on this question, but less on comparative law. So I want to talk about two things. First is put the nominating committee in a, in a comparative perspective. And then I want to talk a little bit about the concept of legitimacy. So first, I want to talk about the nominating committee in particular with one comparison that keeps kind of arising. Um, uh, we see in a lot of discussions, which is comparing it with the United States, the Electoral College. Okay? In the United States, we have um, the United States president is actually not selected by the, the people. It's actually selected through an electoral college. Um, each state chooses a certain number of electors based on, a, um, on their population. And in total, there are 538 electors in the United States, and each of these electors meet after the general election and choose the United States president. Uh, now, I think in this regard, it's an interesting comparison with the nominating committee. Uh, and there have been statements made in, in the press about the comparison between the two. Now, well, the point I want to make is that formally, of course, this was created in the late 1700s in the United States. The elect this electoral college is a way to avoid public input. It was a way of saying, here's a filter. Um, but over time, in the last 250 years, we've seen a number of laws passed at the state level, and also just informal practices arise. Um, in the way in which the nominating, the electoral college in the United States operates. And now, according to both state law and custom, each state chooses the electors are by law or custom are actually required or bound to vote for who wins this, the popular vote in that state. Okay, so the real lesson we have here is, I think, and a comparative lesson to think about, is the importance then not just of formal rules at the constitutional level, but also sub-constitutional statutes, practices, and so forth. So. I think in one way, I think this comparison, and one that I haven't seen made as in much in the conversations, is, is really to think about, to think about the nominating committee and the way in which the, the proposed reform works, and the decision to pocket or no pocket, is putting it in more of a context. And I'd be curious, very curious to get our speakers to talk a little bit more about how much they've thought about different uh, statutes that might play a role in how the nominating committee would function, and how much that plays a role in the political um, negotiations that are taking place. Now, I know that Professor Simon Young has written exclusively, a written, written a number of very good articles on this, particularly looking at what exactly the party affiliation of the chief executive could be under the current ordinance for the chief executive. Uh, the chief executive is required to step down from a party affiliation after election. So the question is, could that be changed? Would that make a difference? Uh, open question for our panel and for our discussion afterwards. Um, second of all would be to look at are there ways in which you could have a dual track nomination process? Uh, this is something also that Professor Young has proposed. So ways of thinking through what in general these sub-constitutional ordinances can be used as a way of thinking through the way that the nominating committee might operate. So that's the first point I want to make from a comparative point of view and to think through and, and what we can learn from and particularly from the U.S. development of the U.S. Electoral College. Second, I want to talk about uh, the concept of legitimacy. Uh, it comes up a lot in discussions on the chief executive, in particular with the concept of universal suffrage. Uh, people have made comments that saying, well, the, 
by electing the chief executive, it will help to overcome some of Hong Kong's problems, particularly dysfunctions in the executive-led form of governance, um, and particularly thinking through what this universal suffrage reform would actually do in terms of giving the chief executive more legitimacy in the uh, political system in the special administrative region. Now, again, thinking of this in comparative perspective, um, if we look at, say, again, the United States, the United States, the head of the executive branch in the United States is also elected, um, as we know, through a electoral college system that is responsive to the popular will in the states. Um, and we see, too, there that it doesn't solve problems of dysfunction. Um, everyone probably remembers the government shutdown in the United States. Um, so I'm curious, too, to think about what is the long-term uh, structural relationship between the executive and the legislature in Hong Kong, between the chief executive and the legislative council. And how does this decision to pocket or no pocket play a role in that? How do you think through that? So I think those two, I want to I kind of flag those two as kind of comparative points that uh, hopefully our panelists will be able to address at least in part and think through. Um, but now, uh, I really want to turn it over to the, what is the main event of, of our uh, talk today, and this is um, our three panelists. Uh, each of them will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we will have 45 minutes of question and answer. Um, we will uh, please reserve questions till then. Um, when we do get to the question and answer session, I would ask that people raise their hands, and if we have a large number of questions, what I'll do is group questions into twos or threes. Um, and that when you ask a question, I'll remind you again of this when we're finished with the speeches, please identify yourself and your affiliation, and please limit yourself to one question or comment. Um, that would be great. Okay, so um, for our first speaker, we're going to go down the line in order here, um, is Councillor Honorable Miss Emily Lau, um, who is a representative of New Territories East, which I believe is where Chinese University is. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, representative of our university, um, and she'll speak for 15 minutes. I'll, I'll speak for me. Is this okay? Yeah, is this, this is this on? Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hartley, and a very good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, uh, especially to CK, uh, for organizing this event. Uh, which will give us an opportunity to uh, face to face uh, tell you what we think uh, at this very critical juncture in uh, constitutional development in Hong Kong. And, uh, and as you all probably know, uh, this coming Sunday there will be a visit uh, by uh, members of the Legislative Council to Shenzhen to meet uh, Beijing officials. And uh, this is not the first time uh, that such a meeting is being held, but of course, in the past years, uh, such meetings were indeed very rare. And this is very regrettable, because what is needed is for Beijing to understand the wishes and aspirations of the Hong Kong people, to try to uh, communicate with the political parties, uh, to try to uh, foster confidence and mutual respect. And I think those qualities are exceedingly uh, very much lacking. <coughs> so uh, what can one expect out of this meeting? I think if you ask yourself and if you ask many Hong Kong people, they will say, don't expect anything or expect very little that will come of it. Uh, we are in the final phase of the current saga and they probably, the administration will probably come to LegCo on the 17th or the 24th of next month uh, to trigger the debate and then the vote on this resolution about uh, the election of the chief executive in 2017 and also the election of LegCo in 2016. I think that uh, I speak for many Hong Kong people, including many of you in this room, 
that we have been waiting for universal suffrage for many decades. And it is very sad to see that now, coming to the crunch point, that um, as you all know, the package being presented to LegCo will almost certainly be voted down, maybe by a very decisive margin, because according to the basic law, it requires two-thirds of LegCo support before it can be passed. We have 70 members, so we're talking about at least 47 votes in support. And I don't think there will be 47 votes. Uh, there will be many votes uh, vote, uh, opposing it. The reason, uh, of course, different members have different reasons for voting it down. Speaking for my party, the Democratic Party, which actually supported the last constitutional development proposal in 2010, which was not on universal suffrage, but it was to give the whole process a way forward. And my colleague, Mr. Hu Chi Wai, proposed one person, two votes, giving this uh, new, five new con uh, functional constituencies, giving the vote to all Hong Kong people. But uh, the um, candidates and the people who can nominate were restricted to district councillors. And having succeeded in that and moved forward, Beijing said, OK, you've satisfied Article 45 of the Basic Law about gradual and orderly progress. Hence, in 2017, you can elect the chief executive by universal suffrage. And after that, you can elect all members of LegCo by universal suffrage. This is an undertaking from Beijing, something that they have not given before. So what we're saying to them now is, come on, honor, honor your promise. And they say, yes, we have done so. The National People's Congress Standing Committee made the decision on the 31st of August last year, saying, yes, one person, one vote. Not one man, one vote, but one person, one vote. And, but, the nomination will be confined to the nominating committee and that committee's composition will be based on the election committee which chose CY Love in 2012. 1,200 people, four categories. And the people who have a right to elect members of that committee is only a quarter of a million. So all that will not change. And to be validly nominated, you need to have more than half of the committee supporting you. That means even if you have 600, it's not enough. You need at least 601 votes to be nominated. And then the candidates have to love China, love Hong Kong. And there cannot be more than, at most, three candidates. Just then, our the chair of the meeting talked about the, the U.S. system. I don't think such restrictions can be found in the U.S. system. I said, if, if you refer to the U.S. system, well, I'll have that any time. We'll divide Hong Kong into 18 districts, and they will elect the electors, and they form a committee, which will be a darn sight better than the 1,200 people committee that, that we have right now. I all, My party always says, we agree, the election of the chief executive should comply with the basic law. So, like the Bar Association, we have no problem with that. Last year, we proposed this three-track model. Civil nomination, political parties nomination, and nominating committee. And I never said that they have the three have to go together. I said, either one will do. Well, if, if the nominating committee is willing to accept proposal by the public or proposal by political parties, they can also nominate those candidates. But if you can't confine yourself to the nominating committee of Article 45, then the franchise, the base of electors to choose people who can be on the committee must be widened. You cannot just narrow it to a quarter of a million people. 
when we right now have more than three and a half million people register as voters. And those who are qualified to register is over five million. So how can you confine the, the, the electoral base to such a narrow, narrow part of the population? And most are business people, professional people, and the political elites. And the vast majority of the Hong Kong people are excluded. So that's one thing. The other, of course, the nominating threshold cannot be that high. Even in the small circle election that Alan Leung and Albert Ho took part, the nominating threshold was 12.8%, one-eighth. How come this time around is 51%? It's crazy. And of course, there should not be a limit on the number of candidates, two, or at most three. So those restrictions, those limitations are totally unacceptable. And they cannot be found in the basic law. It's just that the National People's Congress Standing Committee made the decision and say, this is it. You have to comply. And we say, sorry, we're not going to comply. We're going to vote you down. And then they say, okay, if you vote it down, that means there's no hope for um, democratizing the electoral election either. Because Beijing said, first, you have to deal with the CE election, and if that's successful, then electoral election. But then if you ask my colleague, including Jeffrey, sitting here, and many in electoral, they have already said they will not give up the functional constituencies. But I said, that's what Beijing said. Beijing said, after that, we give up the we will uh, get rid of the functional constituency. But what they are saying is, you introduce universal suffrage for the functional constituency. Wow, <laughs> what does that mean? That means, like Jeffrey, he's chosen by the Chamber of Commerce. So under universal suffrage, the Chamber of Commerce will nominate Jeffrey one, Jeffrey two, and Jeffrey three. And then one person, one vote. And we have Mr. Lam Singh from the banking sector, so in future, the banks will nominate Lung Singh, David Lee, or whoever, then you, you can have one person, one vote. I mean, that is ridiculous. But that is not just coming from my electrical colleagues. It's even coming from the lips of Beijing officials. So, what kind of universal suffrage are we talking about? Hong Kong is a party to the ICCPR which is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Britain extended that to Hong Kong in 1976. And at the change of sovereignty, Beijing said, yes, that treaty can continue to apply to Hong Kong after 97. Beijing actually signed the ICCPR in October of 1998. But the NPC still, still has not yet ratified it. But Hong Kong has been to the United Nations Human Rights Committees on many occasions to submit its report on the implementation of the ICCPR. But the Hong Kong government and the Human Rights Committee disagree on universal suffrage. Hong Kong government said it will only be implemented according to the basic law. But the Human Rights Committee does not dispute the authority of the basic law. But they also say that it should be in compliance with the ICCPR. And my position, it is possible to comply with the basic law and to comply with the ICCPR. So ladies and gentlemen, we are at this very, very critical juncture. And the president of LegCo said about two years ago, if a political reform package is not passed, Hong Kong could become ungovernable. And there are other people in the pro-government sector who have also issued dire warnings. The convener of the Executive Council, of which my colleague Jeffrey is also a member, Mr. W.K. Lam, said, we took part in the RTHK back chat program on the 1st of May. He said, he was very blunt, very frank. He said, only pro-establishment people could become candidates. People from the pro-democracy camp, he said, you can become kingmakers. I said, WK, I have never fought for democracy all my life to say that we just become a kingmaker. Come on, that's not democracy. 
But I guess the fight for democracy will go on. It will go on. And for many of you who are very young, when we are gone, you will carry on the fight. Because you know very well that you and your families and friends all would like to have a democratic Hong Kong underpinned by the rule of law, respect for social justice. So this struggle will not end. And I must say, my party insists the struggle will be peaceful, orderly, and non-violent. Because I think that's the way forward. I do not support violence. But Hong Kong people, maybe they know what they want to do, and they will have to take responsibility for their actions. And I hope all of you in this room and at the Chinese University will understand why some of us will vote against the package and will work with the rest of Hong Kong to fight for democracy. Because I am sure one day democracy will prevail in Hong Kong and in mainland China. And I hope all of us will live long enough to see that. Thank you very much. Mr. Jeffrey Lamb, um, who is a member of the Legislative Council as well, um, and also the Vice Chairman of Business and Professionals Alliances for Hong Kong. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Chinese University, for inviting me here today. <coughs> I did not vote for CY. <laughs> is a game, you know, you have to choose side. But once the game is over, it's over. I, I believe in supporting our government, the central government, as, as well as the Hong Kong, let say, our government. Um, if uh, after the election we continue to confront, uh, it's not good for Hong Kong. Um, some people think um, I or the uh, pro-government can always fight with the uh, Pan Dam, the Democrats. I I'm actually a very good friend with Ronnie, Emily. We, we talk, we eat, we play together. <laughs> we just don't fight. We just don't fight. We, 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 we act very sensibly. Um, but, you know, we, we, we are, uh, you know, Hong Kong now stands at a juncture of its history. Of Hong Kong can vote for their leader. Uh, let, let's talk a little, uh, uh, for a little while. Let, let's not talk, talk about whether this is a genuine um, package or not, because some people believe it is, and some people don't believe. And actually, who brought democracy to Hong Kong is not the Americans, not the Brits. It's the central government. Before the handover, we did not have democracy. Uh, what came along in the past 17 years? It was the central government who gave Hong Kong the right, you know, first of all, uh, to progress on democracy. Um, so, um, some time ago, the government put forward a proposal. Um, if the reform proposal is passed, selecting CE by the universal suffrage, again, let's not argue on whether it is a genuine or not a genuine, a, a fake uh, universal suffrage. It will no longer be a dream. Um, by then, 5 million eligible voters will be able to select our CE by one person, one vote. Uh, you know, this is a big change from the old days. Uh, the governors were nominated and sent over by plane or by boat to Hong Kong. But if the reform proposal fails, there will be endless political wrangling. The introduction of democracy would come to a halt, and political conflicts would plague the city. This would affect Hong Kong's economic competitiveness. 
uh, while harming relations with Beijing. Why I mention economic competitiveness? We see in the past few months what went on in Mexico. Regardless of whether uh, there's livelihood issues or uh, economic issues, we don't get anything done. We wasted hundreds and hundreds of hours uh, sitting there, walking in and out of the chamber. You all see that. It's a waste of money. Like we see almost every week, after coming to an end last, um, last December, the Occupy Central Movement has turned to be a series of spontaneous guerrilla actions, including the so-called shopping tour campaign. Uh, um, what, what, what brought that along? This confrontation, this trust. Uh, the protesters do whatever they want in the name of genuine universal suffrage. But I think Hong Kong people have seen enough of these conflicts. We, we want peace. When I was walking in, um, somebody mentioned uh, he works for peace. I said I also work for peace, but in a different sense, a different meaning. Uh, we all want peace in Hong Kong. We all want Hong Kong to be peaceful and progress in an orderly manner. Every one of us is aware that after the handover, Hong Kong enjoys far more democracy than was permitted by London during its colonial rule. As I said earlier, the governors who rule Hong Kong were sent by London, who made no contribution to building up democracy in our inequality in, in those days. The crescent selecting of the CE through the 1,200 members of the election committee. Uh, if, if the present proposal is passed, it will allow 5 million eligible voters to select the CEE for the first time in the history of Hong Kong. We now enjoy democracy because that is the right according to the basic law. And also, don't forget, we, we, we don't just talk about this law, we have to talk about, we have to concern about the, uh, the law in China. So it's Beijing that has made one man or one person, one vote possible in the city. Uh, and it's, we are seeing this only 17 years after the handover. However, some said the government proposal is not genuine universal suffrage citing international standards. You know, talking about international standards, one country, two system has no international standard. We are the only one. Every country only allows one country, one system. But we must understand the realistic perspective. Hong Kong's constitution development must proceed according to its own situation. Earlier, Professor mentioned about the U.S. system. We are not the United States. We are not the United Kingdom. So, all those systems we can take it as a reference. But we have to choose our own way. But what is the best way? Now, Hong Kong is actually quite split. Uh, we have many, many different proposals. We, we are not getting any consensus. But we have a proposal that is put on the table for us to choose. And, and what are the, the, the realities in Hong Kong? Hong Kong is only a special administrative region under the rule of the central government. And this is something that we cannot change. Its power comes solely from the authorization of the central government. How can one oppose Beijing work together with the central government? <coughs> Such chief executive pose a threat to the country's sovereignty. That's why NPC Standing Committee set the, S, the, set the CE Universal uh, uh, Suffrage Framework. So the proposal with the nomination committee, I think is suitable for our part. Moreover, take a look at every electoral system around the world. The US has its own system, as Professor had just mentioned. But look at 
Britain and Germany. They also have a different system. The newly elected uh, British Prime Minister, David Cameron, is only elected by about 300 votes, which are all their party members. Of course, you can say that they are elected by uh, people in different districts. Uh, but when compared to Hong Kong, which offer a chance for 5 million registered voters to choose, <coughs> is it more democratic or not? We can say it is or it is not. What is more consistent with international definition of universal suffrage? Hong Kong may be new to democratic elections, but its proposal is certainly no less democratic than the British system. The upper house still consists of the members. You know, Hong Kong has no more appointed members. Yes, maybe you can say the um, executive council, the members are by appointments. In fact, there is no perfect system. In our real world, including new democracies in Asia, the Philippines, Thailand, to name a few, after adopting Western-style democracy, have not enjoyed the prosperity and stability they expected. We see disturbances in those countries every few months. The central government is well aware of democ uh, democracy's positive and negative aspects. Uh, you know, some people say that uh, Beijing do not understand the Hong Kong real situation. Hong Kong officials don't pass this, the true message to Beijing. Is it the case? I think they know more than most of us. Every detail. And Ronnie and Emily, I'm sure you can ask frank questions to those officials. And I hope you get what you want. I, I doubt it. <laughs> uh, you know, this is why basic law lays out some criteria, for example, to look into the actual situation and to proceed in a gradual and orderly manner, uh, while fulfilling Hong Kong people's aspiration for universal suffrage. Orderly and gradual manner, you know, we don't want Hong Kong to wanted to be progressing in a orderly manner because Hong Kong is not just political. We are a financial center. We can not net uh, our action, whether it's right or wrong, whatever is action, disrupt Hong Kong. Because without people investing in Hong Kong, uh, creating jobs, uh, our reserve will go down very, very fast. So we, we need those. Besides, it really depends on whether your view, you view the proposal as a glass of a glass half empty or a glass half full. Some see the proposal as not democratic, since a nomination committee of 1,200 people who have power over who finally has a chance to campaign. But so are some of the other countries. Uh, talking about the United States, people really don't get to nominate. Party uh, on the contrary, some see it as democratic. Once a candidate has to get a minimum of 120 nominations from the committee, they will then be able to campaign and garner as many of the 5 million votes as they require to get into the office. What is most important is political reform is an evolving process. We have to start somewhere. We, we have started a few years ago. I, I really admire the Democratic Party for what they did a few years ago. Uh, they did move uh, democracy in Hong Kong a step forward. But we need to go another step forward. But now we are having some differences. But in differences, who don't have, who don't have, but problems are made for us to solve. Let's see how we can resolve it this time. 
I, I think this might be called imperfect by the Pan Democrats. I think we should start with the government's proposal. Now, aside from the business community, more citizens have expressed their hope for realizing universal suffrage in 2017. As shown by opinion polls over the past few months, and some were actually done by your university, more people supported the government proposal than opposing it. Pan Democrats always accuse the CY administration of not listening to public opinion. Am I part of it, being a member of the Executive Council? But I, I do listen. Uh, it, it is not really the case. Maybe the, the, the decisions by the government or by CY sometimes are not to your favor. Uh, but they, they are. But, but are they listening to public opinion? It is for you to answer. It is clear that if this deal is not accepted, if it is not passed, then the status quo decides things will stay as, as is, as they are. This is probably the time for everyone to take a deep breath. Because in the name of genuine universal suffrage, more filibustering by pan-democrats legislators will come. More protests may take place. <coughs> Politics is often about accepting compromise. The deal here is simple enough. Either have a step forward or stick by the idealism and hope Hong Kong will not get stuck. At present, everything we want to do is blocked by and downwards. In natural and outside, and nothing get passed. You know, this year, the construction work passed by the Justice Council is history low. Well, thank God we don't have enough work this year, otherwise we'll have a lot of problems. But we are not talking about uh, importation of labor in Hong Kong today. <laughs> and under an unstable political system, many economic and livelihood issues cannot be solved. <clears throat> so I suggest let's start with the first step. It does offer the chance for 5 million voters in Hong Kong to choose between different candidates uh, under the present proposal. Uh, at least two, uh, likely to be two to three, can come out and let you choose. It also means a culture of political leadership can be nurtured as long as people participate. Hong Kong deserves better quality governance. In addition, the city will have a more stable future. This will benefit economic development and prosperity. Therefore, I sincerely hope the proposal gains full public support, but that's not enough. And also the support of Emily, Ronnie, and your alliance. Uh, let us find a way to get through a step forward. Uh, you know, this is not the end of the world. Uh, we can continue to make suggestions. I'm sure there are ways to improve what it is um, or improve to the present system. But I believe in taking another step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lam. Uh, finally, we have um, Councillor Ronnie Tong, who is, uh, also comes from New Territories East constituency. Um, and we will, uh, yeah, forward yours. Oh, thank you, Professor. I, I hope it's not by design that. Uh, that I should speak last because uh, I find myself in an indigenous position having heard two speeches from my eminent brothers as and sister. <laughs> having heard the passionate speech of Emily and the rather with feet on the ground speech from Jeffrey. Um, I'm not sure I have anything to say, but, but unfortunately, I've taken a sandwich provided by uh, the professor and the organizers, and, and I can't possibly get away with a free lunch, can I? So, so I would venture. No, I think one is enough. Uh, so, I have to venture to put forward my, my two cents. Um, the question today is uh, sorry, it's not on here. 
is to pocket or not to pocket. Um, Emily said it's not even English. <laughs> but, but let's, uh, let's uh, not be technical about it. <laughs> um, I think that is not even a question because it doesn't actually tell you what we are being confronted with or, or, or in what sense uh, we should uh, or how we should tackle the question. So what I want to do first of all is just to uh, do my usual thing, which is a lot of people say that I'm very, very, uh, uh, you know, negative. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't say too many things which are encouraging to people. I, I'm always criticizing others. Emily is the first to say that. I always criticize her. Uh, but uh, I, I want to you know, put everybody in the right perspective. So I want to say what are the things which are not decisive. I heard what the professor said uh, as opening remarks, which uh, is very enlightening. But uh, I'm sorry, professor. What is not decisive is law. Well, that's not actually correct. I, I need to rephrase it. But you know, you, you get my feeling. Uh, you should you should start with law, because any package needs to comply with the constitution. Period. But then thereafter, there is a whole wilderness of area for you to cover, which has absolutely nothing to do with law. And law will come in again at the very end, if we reach a consensus, there is a package which everybody accepts, that you need to go to the law to implement it. So law is not decisive, by no means. Law is numbers. Uh, opinion polls doesn't help. But this morning I, I, heard, I, I read another uh, poll conducted by the eminent university here, uh, 45 against 42 point something percent. I asked myself, what is the point of all this? Political reform is not decided by numbers. If we were, it's very simple, I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here. These polls, what they do is rather to help and resolve the question they help to make the gap wider. It help people with opposing views to be able to say with a stronger voice, I have opinion behind me. The Pandemocrats went down to the district, tried to win support with a lot of help from the government officials, I have to say, because they are really disastrous uh, in going down to the district. Um, and that helped the numbers going up. But I asked a rhetorical question, to what end? Are you going to be able to say, look, I have 51%, therefore your 49% has got to accept what I, what I think? How do you think the 49% will say? And turn it the other way around. Can the 47, sorry, 42% say to the 45%, you're going to listen to me, I have I have justification. I have a just cause behind my back. No, you're not going to convince people with numbers. And then people say, well, you're a legislator. You're elected by the people of Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Why can't you listen to the opinion of people? I'm sorry. That's a complete misunderstanding of a political structure. You might have read the works of uh, you know, Edmund Burke. He, he, I think he puts it, the nature and the substance of the representative government in a very good uh, nutshell. We, that is, we as uh, uh, representative of the people, are elected not to represent only those voters who put votes in your favor. You are represented because the system would have to allow voters to choose by different districts, different strata, different people. But you are representative of the entire territory. I was elected in New Territories East, but I never regard myself as merely, in quotes, a representative of New Territories East. I represent the whole of Hong Kong. Even though those people who didn't vote for me, people who voted for Jeffrey, 
and under a representative system, you don't, you don't, you don't practice politics, and, and you don't vote by reference to a poll every day. People elect, elected you because they trust your political acumen. They believe that you are trustworthy to exercise people's power on their behalf. And then you have to exercise your own judgment as to where you stand on a particular issue. Of course you have to pay heed to what is going on in the community. But it's not decisive. And if you disagree with what I might disagree with my judgment, the test is when it comes to the election next time, you will not vote for me. And when I stand up here, I would pledge my utmost to that system. And if I don't get, elect get elected next time, if I were to run again, that is. That is, that is the whole point of the system. So numbers or polls, they don't count. They can't resolve differences, particularly when we have such a wide gulf here between the pocket side and the not pocket side. The third thing which is not decisive is where there's a good package. It's got, I can tell you, I mean, you may, it may sound very cynical. It's got absolutely nothing underlined in bold letters, nothing to do with whether it's a good package. A good package is a package that both sides can agree to. If it's a package that they can't agree on, it's not even a package. It's just a, a suggestion on the table. They will not realize into what is to happen to our political structure in the future. So don't start saying what is a good package. Now, of course, all generalizations are false. And I'm not trying to, I, you know, if I generalize too much, you would say that what Ronnie Town, you're just uh, talking rubbish. When I say uh, a good package is a package that both sides can agree on. I don't mean that each side will have to forego all their principles. But you have to try to find a, a, a point of balance between what the other side would accept and what your side would accept. If simply insisted, insisted by the perfect model or the most democratic model, it's certainly not a good model because it won't be accepted by the other side. So, so long as you can achieve what you set out to achieve without compromising your basic <coughs> principles, you have to learn to compromise. Somebody said, politics is the art of, of, of compromise. Well, actually, there is a, a more apt saying, which is that politics is about engaging each other to resolve differences. So, <coughs> You would ask, well, after five minutes, ten minutes, sorry, my time will be up in a minute, so don't worry. So, Ronnie, you said, you said all these negative things, and what, what are we looking at? Well, I would say that we, just, we have to start to understand whether we, by we, we say both Beijing, because we are part of China, and Hong Kong people. Do we know each other? Do we understand each other? Do we know what the other side thinks? Beijing certainly does not understand Hong Kong people. When I went up to Beijing, I think three weeks ago, I was asked by one of the officials, who said, oh, Ronnie, he didn't call me Ronnie, because uh, we didn't use English name. We didn't talk in English. He used Budunghua, he said, Chao Wa. You must read this article. And he, he showed me an article, which is uh, a, a quarterly magazine written by our eminent Lao Xiu Gai, you all know Lao Xiu Gai, right? He's one of the CFCBU, um, a very, very learned advisor to Beijing at the moment. He said, the, the, the official said, you must read it. I opened it. My God, it's 8,000 words. I can tell you, it's a lot of words to read when it's 12 o'clock at night after the meeting. But nonetheless, I, I want to read it. But it's, it's got only just one message. People who write, in China, they, they like to write a lot of words, but they only have one message. <laughs> um, the one message, very simply, is that this, this being in the political debate, is a direct conflict 
between people who want Hong Kong to become a political independent body and Hong Kong SAR as a, a highly, uh, 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 how should I put it, uh, uh, properly empowered by Beijing government uh, to have uh, self rule. And I said, my God, 8,000 words. It's got nothing to do with Hong Kong. I mean, I don't believe, I've never met anybody. I'm sorry, in, in my in my <laughs> whole life here, not to mention the last 11 years as a legislator, I've never met anybody who actually come over to me and say, Hong Kong is an independent political body. And therefore, we want a good democratic system. No. That's not the way that we operate. That's not the way we think. But that's the way Beijing thinks. And what about the pan-democrats? They're not any good either. And Democrats, they, they are still stuck, even today, we're now living in 2015, they're still stuck with a street fighting pressure group mentality that we all grew up with in the 80s. But we're now in 2015. And, and one thing nobody seems to think about or care about is this, that China, in 1984, when it agreed the sign of British Declaration, is a completely different animal from the China today. I dare say that if China and Britain were to negotiate a handover today, I can bet you my lunch <laughs> <laughs> that there will be no one country, two systems. China, we got itself as a superpower today. It can take on the United States plus. England, together, plus EU together. They're not going to give you one country, two systems. They gave you one country, two systems in 1984, and they're regretting it. But um, the, the other thing about Beijing is that they care about face. They have made a promise. They have to stick with it. And the same with the basic law. And so when I went up to see Beijing officials, I, I asked one question. I said, is democracy in Hong Kong in conflict with the one country, two systems? He has to say no. Then I asked myself, I didn't say it to the Beijing officials, of course. I asked myself, why do we make it a conflict? Why do we have to pitch democracy in Hong Kong as a, 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 a conflicting concept with the one country, two systems. You know what Beijing people think? They think one country, two systems is a compromise. It was a compromise I made in 1984. You, Hong Kong person, that's me, you have taken the two systems and you want to get rid of the one country. Is that fair? You're having to kick and eat it. Then I ask myself, why, why was it that we have given that impression to Beijing. It's because of we never talk. There, there's actually a song about people not talking. You, you might remember that. Husband and wife, that is, of course. <laughs> <laughs> not talking with each other, and, and you end up with, in a divorce. And, and we are on the brink of divorce. I'm telling you, I'm very worried. I'm not worried about the political reform not getting passed. I'm worried about the political reform dragging down the one country, two systems. And that's why I'm, I'm planning to set up a think tank, because I want to save the one country, two systems, not political reform. Because I believe that if one day we can truly understand and appreciate one country, two systems, and we can truly understand and appreciate each other, that will be the day that we have genuine democracy in Hong Kong, not before. Because Beijing wouldn't have it. And we can't have it without Beijing's consent. Because this is, the, this is the situation that we find ourselves in. This is not the age of revolution. In the Qing Dynasty, yes, you can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can have uprising. Not today. This is an age of nuclear bombs and internet. You just, you just can't. I mean, you have to try to engage each other and understand and get the maximum what you can get. Now, I believe, 
I still believe that it is possible for Hong Kong people to get genuine democracy when Beijing is persuaded that it is not a threat to them. And this is what we have set up to do, to demonstrate that we are not a threat to Beijing. What we have done, I'm sorry to say, so far, is exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. Now, it is out of good intentions, out of good cause, I agree. But the effect, the net effect, is the opposite. I always say that when you try to persuade your opponent, you don't tell them they're wrong. You have to make them realize that they're wrong. So telling them in the face, pointing to his nose and saying, you are wrong, would have exactly the opposite effect. Try that with your mother. <laughs> you, you see what I mean, right? So, to pocket or not to pocket, I have to say, if you ask me this question, have you taken a sandwich? I have to give an answer. I would say, don't pocket it. Not simply because it's not what we wanted. It's because I genuinely believe that we are not, we don't have the right conditions to pocket a political system which would determine the future for all, pe all people of Hong Kong, for all our generations to come. We're not there yet. I keep saying to the Beijing officials, I said, it's good to have dialogue, <coughs> but please don't have a dialogue because of political reform. You need to have a dialogue before political reform. We do it the other way around. Sorry, I, I haven't really given you a, a, a good answer to the question, but I hope I've given you food for thought to think about things in a slightly different angle and try to reach inside yourself and ask yourself this question. Are we ready for political reform in three weeks' time? Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, for three very interesting and thought-provoking um, talks. And also, not only that, within the uh, time limit. So we have 45 <laughs> minutes um, to discuss. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. So um, the way I'm going to do this is just to repeat, is to go through. I'll try to take groups of questions if we see a lot of hands up. Also, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Pellet for putting uh, forth such a uh, most enlightening and unique panel. So I've learned a great deal. Um, now, as uh, Ronnie said, uh, politics is the art of the possible. The whole thing boils down to a lack of mutual trust between Beijing and the Pan Democrats. Now, Beijing, of course, um, have all trust in the other parties, but not the Demo Pan Democrats. This is a reality. Um, then the second uh, uh, dimension we need to take into account of is that Beijing is unlikely uh, to succumb to coercion. It was absolutely a fantasy that Beijing would change the 831 uh, position uh, and to change the basic law to comply with the pandemic plus demands. Now, as mutual trust cannot be built through coercion, so my question is to the, the um, pandemic rest. Uh, would the pan-democrats be better off by, um, of course, making this point very clear and very consistent by opposing the package um, throughout? Don't give in. But see the package be passed by a small, small, small margin. Now, this would send a clear signal to Beijing that this current package is not ideal. There's plenty of room for improvement, but by doing so, Hong Kong would have the first chance, the first step, to cast the books. Five million would cast the books on the next chief executive. Uh, I would round up my question uh, uh, immediately. Now, this doesn't mean that the pandemicrats would forever, would be forever be excluded because of this lack of trust from the leadership uh, in Hong Kong because the, the possibilities do exist, and there's plenty of room there 
uh, for Beijing to co-opt um, suitable members of the Pan Democrat Party with people with democratic background into the um, the governing team, as it were. For example, we already have very able ministers with democratic background. Um, I don't think that Beijing would necessarily quibble if one of these uh, people, you know, could run for chief executive. So trust must be built um, as a working relationship, and trust cannot be forced by coercion. So my question is that would the Pan Democrats uh, consider that under the these realities, uh, the, the democratic movement would be better served uh, to see the package pass with a small, small margin, so that, so that five million voters can cast their vote and then open up further room for the democratic movement in Hong Kong. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take a couple more questions. Who else has questions? Yeah, in the back. And remember, please identify yourself in your, your uh, Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Terence Sam, uh, CUHK, uh, Juris Doctor, UN student. Uh, thank you for, for the speakers for the um, uh, enlightening, uh, enlightening speech. Um, I, my concern is not about whether to pass the package or not. Uh, that question is from Mr. Jeffrey Lam. Uh, I think in the current proposal, there is a very illogical part for me. Uh, in the nomination process, you need to have a um, uh, more than half of the uh, half of the members support you to be a candidate. But in the uh, actual election part, they do not have to have more than half of the votes of the electors. Uh, I think it's illogical because um, you have a high threshold for nomination, but you have a low threshold for for election. So it for me, it's, it, it it is just putting the election power also on the nomination committee. Um, I'm raising this because even my mother thinks this is illogical, and I, I think my mother is those silent majority. So I think the pan Democrats will not be um, satisfied if this is um, changed. But I think um, will the uh, pro government camp try your best uh, adding this into the proposal so to rally um, more um, Hong Kong residents to support the package. So perhaps as um, your colleague said. We will um, provide the courage for the pandemic to change and support the package. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take one more question. Yeah. Uh, Manohar Chukwu. I'm the chairman of Misha Electronics, a businessman. In a business, uh, sometimes we have to cut the losses. We don't cut the losses. Loss, losses could be multiple factor. We say bad is better than burst. It's easy to decide between a bad and good, but when it comes bad and worse, it becomes difficult for many people. I agree with Emily, this is not a universal suffrage, genuine rural suffrage, but also at the same time, I agree with Jeffrey Lamb that this is a one step forward. So we have to see what is bad and what is the worst. We always compare when you're in business the advantage and disadvantage of option A and advantage and disadvantage of option two. So looking at that, I think so, it's good to accept the proposal because there's a bad proposal, but better than burst if we don't accept. And also, we talk more about the problems. We every day hear the go, Hong Kong is getting ungovernable. We also hear every day the society is very polarized. But most of the time, people, they talk about a problem and not about a solution. So my question to panelists is, can they come out with concrete suggestions which can unite the community? Okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll take those three questions first. So, Councilor Lau, uh, Thank you very much. Um, the first question, can we get it passed with a <laughs> razor-thin majority? It's not for us to decide. It's for the individual members. I mean, I can speak for the six members of the Democratic Party, but for the rest, so don't don't trust the media when they say we are all bundled up. <laughs> can you can you just imagine? Can you bundle up Ronnie Tong? <laughs> no way. So it's for the members to decide, and we have never discussed 
a scenario where, okay, we will let the package be passed with two votes, uh, your margin. And some people actually said, if it is passed by such a thin margin, uh, the atmosphere would be so tense that uh, there could be big commotion or even unrest. Because some people say that on the day of the voting and prior to that, uh, they're calling on many Hong Kong people together outside LegCo and the CGO. And, uh, and if the atmosphere becomes so tense, then uh, people fear there could be a very big, big problem. So anyway, but, but to answer your question is we've never discussed it like that. And uh, I respect uh, the decision of my colleagues in the pro-democracy camp. And I have never heard anyone uh, proposing uh, that to say, hey, or hey, Ronnie, or Charles, or Kenneth, why don't you give them the votes so that it can be passed by a majority of one or something. And then, but we can still argue it's very bad because it's not perfect. So sorry, <laughs> I don't think that's something that, uh, that we have discussed or that uh, many people seriously <laughs> propose to us. Uh, but I, I know where you're coming from. And the other thing is, um, well, the last question, uh, we have weighed the pros and cons of you know, uh, the current package. And uh, I think uh, the professor here talked about legitimacy. And we fear that if we allow the package to be passed, and then we have uh, three, four, five million people voting, then of course the administration will claim that whoever is elected is very legitimate because it got so many votes. Uh, but everybody will know that the electoral system is deeply flawed. So why should we help to bring about this system whereby they can claim? A, and Beijing will say, yeah, we've satisfied Article 45 of the Basic Law. That's it. That's what Carrie Lam said when she came, came to LegCo to unveil the, uh, the, the latest proposals. So uh, even if they don't move forward to do, make any more amendments, don't be surprised because they say we've done it. This is it. And also, the other thing, and we, it goes on to the LegCo election. And then they will say, now we've done, we've achieved the C election, now LegCo. And then people like Jeffrey and his allies will come out and say, oh, let's democratize the functional constituency. Each one will be one person, one vote. So when you actually go to the polls, you probably have about uh, 35 votes <laughs> because each functional constituency, you can cast a vote. I mean, we'll just turn Hong Kong into a big farce. <laughs> I, I just, I cannot imagine that. But I think if, if Jeffrey is willing, you can tell the audience that you will not support democratizing or getting rid of the functional constituencies. So, uh, so uh, it's not pointing the right way forward. If we support this, they will say, hey, now you have one person, one vote for that. You can also have one person, one vote for the functional constituencies. So it will just make matters even more complicated. So I'd much rather that we have nothing. So what? Then we start with a clean slate. We talk all again. And I agree with Romy. We've got to engage. I speak as someone who cannot go to mainland China for more than two decades. In the council, 70 members, at least seven have been banned by Beijing for more than 20 years. And that tells you, you know, how much they dislike us, dis mistrust us. So it is a very, very big problem. And Beijing's doing nothing to solve the problem. And I don't know whether people like Jeffrey is doing anything to help, but for 20 odd years, you know, there is this huge divide. It's very difficult, and there are lots of problems ahead of us. I feel very, very sorry about it. Thanks. In Council Lam, well, maybe not just uh, the mainland, maybe Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one very important aspect, one very important point behind democracy is respect. You know, um, we, we are sitting here very peacefully. We are. It, uh, expressing our views and points. Uh, I don't bring any pistols or uh, swords to, to get our points across. I think we all have to respect different opinions. 
I do have my opinion on functional constituency, which you may not agree. But that, that's, that's something that was created back in the 80s. Um, the, uh, some of the Democrats, they also supported this because at that point in time, they would like to see Hong Kong going forward like before, like what it was in the 80s, 70s, 60s. Um, do we foresee any change? I, I'm sure we're going to have changes even or after the package is passed. It's, it's not the end of the world. Pocket or not pocket. First of all, if we pocket it, nobody's going to take it away from us. And we can still modify uh, according to uh, the situation or the realities in Hong Kong. So it, it is not the end of the road. I, I said it many, many times. If we pocket it today, we take it. We take what we have. And nobody is going to take it away from us. Beijing has already said it. You know, once we give this promise, um, we'll honor the promise. So it comes back to trust, mutual trust. Ronnie has said there is a lack of mutual trust between Beijing and some in Hong Kong. Uh, what, what I just said, many people say, I don't believe in a word Beijing said. Stop. Stop right there. Okay. Pocket or more pocket. They have the news. If we pocket it now, this is it. Nothing will be changed. Uh, I, I think we have to take a step back. Uh, again, democracy, we have to do it uh, in an orderly and progressive manner. Look at all the uh, democratic countries. They all have different systems. And their law and election system have changed over the years. According to um, the situation that we face. In England, you, you think all the politicians or the people are very quiet about their system. They also have noise. They also want change. Uh, but they do not, the people are more sensitive, the people are more rational. They don't say if you uh, support this bill, this package, we're going to get 100,000 people to surround the legislative council. Democracy, democracy should not take threat. Nobody should threaten anyone. If you do this, I'm going to do this to you. You know, like a... a um, journalist wrote an article, you know, he was, she was threatened, you know, by some. Uh, I, I think everybody should be given um, a chance to vote according to, to, to their view. I respect <clears throat> She said, we're not bundled. But some are saying that, I don't care what the other side says, you know, we're going to bundle up, we, we're going to have 27 against you. Um, nobody is going to unbundle us. Uh, but, but of course, you know, all, all 27 may have different views on this package. You know, and I think we all should have the chance of voting according to our view. Uh, you know, as to the, um, uh, the election process, whether there should be, there should be at least half of the Five million voters, the number that actually vote on that day, uh, and the number of the elected ones should exceed half. I don't think that's necessary. El Gore got more than 50% of the vote, and he lost. Bush became president. Of course, that's another system that we have to look at whether that is good for us or that's not good for us. And if we have three candidates, it's likely that, or that there will be a chance that will be 40, 30, 30. So no one will get 50. 
So what, 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 we, uh, what should we do? Do another round of election? Uh, that becomes very costly and very chaotic. Uh, so I don't think the 50% on the, on, the, uh, on the voting day is, is necessary. So um, the decision by the um, NPC standing committee is um, we, we should respect that, you know, and they will not change. But there is an opinion to ask you to change, uh, and I don't think they will change. Uh, even if you, if they were asked on Sunday, I think it's likely that the answer will be no. Okay, because <clears throat> again, there are very many different uh, uh, views uh, around the city. So if they change to satisfy one, and what about the others? There will be a, a, another round of debate, another round of consultation, another round of whatever. So there will be no ending. There will be no nobody will take that step forward. So um, I I look forward to get I look forward to this package getting passed. I hope somebody will. I wouldn't say turn. We'll vote for it because I think Hong Kong needs this democratic process to go forward. Pocket, and nobody will take it away from you. Councillor Tom, anything to? Well, uh, I shall be very brief. Uh, fortunately, there are only three alternatives. I don't think uh, I'm capable of handling more than three alternatives. Uh, the three alternatives are to pass, not to pass, and pass with a thin majority. If you ask me to rank the three, I think to pass it with a thin majority would be most harmful to Hong Kong. The next would be to veto it. And the least harmful to Hong Kong would be to pass it with a, with a relatively large majority. Reason very simple. I, I mentioned about political reform is not a question about numbers. But if you look at the numbers, you see that while there are something like 45% of people who wanted to see the package pass, they simply wanted it to pass. But the other 42%, in particular, about 30% of the 42%, they are really angry about it. They say that, if you look at all the polls, they say that no matter what you give me, I don't want it. Now, if you look around, if you have a situation like this, that's what revolutions are made of, or uprisings are made of. You don't need 10, 20% of people. All you need is enough people, 50,000, 100,000 people, going onto the street and causing trouble. And it is just not just about trouble in the streets. It is also about how the Legislative Council can function. If you, you think today's bad, it will be ten times worse if it's passed by a thin majority. All the three major political parties will be so angry, and Emily here would be so angry, but she probably would be the least active in courts uh, of the legislative councillors, who would express their anger in ways that you, 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 can, you can imagine. And if you ask me, is, is it worth the price for Hong to pay to get such to get this package through? I would say no. If this package had answered ten percent of my aspiration or the aspiration of people in Hong Kong, I may I may consider it, but it doesn't. It is it's completely not something that we want. And to risk it with near term uh, possibly uh, catastrophic uh, uh, chaos in Hong Kong. It's simply not worth it. So I, I, I was the one, in fact, I was the first one in Hong Kong to say that, to say to the government, that is the SAR government, don't ever talk about getting it passed with four votes. I have spent one year persuading them, and they have finally come around, I think a month ago, to say that no, they are aiming for 13 or 14 votes. So passing, passing it with a, with a small margin is 
definitely no go. I, I, I can see the frustration. I can see the frustration of the men in the street. Sorry, correct that. I can see the frustration of the men and women in the street. Uh, Emily is very, is very particular about how I say things. But, I mean, you know, we, we also have shared the same frustration, even more. But as I said, the conditions are not right. And I want to make conditions right in order to get a better deal for the people. Let's take three more questions. My name is Michael Somerville, BPF, Think Tank. My name is Michael Somerville, BPF, Think Tank, and I think I'm the only member in the room who was a member of the Basic Law Consulting Group. Is that right? <laughs> Anybody else was a member of the Basic Law? No. Uh, just, may I make just a couple of comments on this? One is the professor in his introduction talked about the, uh, the uh, electoral uh, committee, I don't know what you call it, in the United States. This has taken 200 years to get where it is at the moment. Uh, reform to me seems to be always a gradual process. Electoral reform always seems to be a gradual process. In the UK at the moment, we've been arguing about reforming the House of Lords for as long as I can remember. Uh, and we still haven't found a solution in, the UK, in my home country, the UK. So my first comment. My second comment is, I'm always puzzled by this argument about functional constituencies, because I'm not really quite certain why geography uh, is more democratic than function. This is a conceptual thought. But come to, my, come to my question. Are we not fighting the wrong war? Because... Um, the, the essence of the, what the, the decision that's come down from, from the central government this relates to their concern that they want the candidates that come forward to be people who are acceptable. That's at the heart of, the, or the heart of this, this issue. And that's within their power. We can argue about it, but it's within their power to control. But under the basic law, there are things that are within, within our power to change in Hong Kong. And amongst those things that are within our power to change in Hong Kong is the, 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 the makeup within those four sections of the, 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 the electoral committee, or the, 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 the denominating committee as it's now going, to be, now going to be called under this new system. So should we not be spending our energies and efforts on trying to make that committee more representative and to kind of reach a consensus as to how to do it with the two sides rather than trying to spend our time fighting against Beijing. That's my question. We'll take a few more questions. Yeah. I'm Professor Lee. Um, I had a few words to Emery before. And uh, Jeffrey and I have been uh, friends for getting about two or thirty years, although we seldom talk a bit. <laughs> and uh, I never met the guy before. <laughs> and uh, as far as the, the um, topic to pocket or not to pocket, I have no conflict of interest. Nonetheless, I think this is a non-issue because we are talking about step two <coughs> instead of step four. The problem with step one is not resolved as yet. It's too difficult to resolve. That's why we skip it and get over to step two. In some way, my feeling echoes the previous speaker. I think we should <coughs> try to resolve the, the composition or the criteria for people to get in to be a candidate. So instead of wasting time now to talk about to pocket or not to pocket, why don't you get over step one before you go to step two? And that's my feeling and that's my comment and I invite comment from the panelists. Thank you. So, anyway, this side of the room, questions? <coughs> okay.
Okay, in the back there. Jean-Philippe Béja, I'm an associate researcher at French Center in Canberra, China, in Hong Kong. Uh, I have a question for uh, Ronnie and Annie. Would you imagine a quid pro quo? For example, like passing the reform project in exchange for uh, a real universal suffrage election of Lechko. For example, accepting the conditions for the chief executive election in exchange for a completely democratic election for Lechko. Would it be possible to envisage? Let's take one more question, yeah. Odilon uh, Cosma have no affiliation. It's a very simple question for Jeffrey Lamb. Since you were very uh, pro the reform, if we can call it a reform proposal, are you aware that many millions of people in China already vote in elections for their representatives? Um, speaking of the village level elections, and can you tell us in what substantive way the proposal for the Hong Kong election of the CE differs? from the so-called democracy that already exists at the village level in China. Thank you. We'll start again in the same word. Thank you very much. Um, the, I think the first two questions are similar, uh, to talk about uh, reforming the, uh, or democratizing the nominating committee. Uh, this is something that, as I said at the beginning, I, we proposed uh, about a model which is based on Article 45 of the Basic Law, the Nominating Committee, saying that but the, uh, the franchise of the electorate should be widened. So we did mention that. And the, uh, the excuse that the administration's giving is that, oh, last year, everybody talked about a civil, civil nomination. And uh, I said, yes, uh, some did. But we, I myself, my party insisted that civil nomination is not the only thing that's acceptable. If, it's, if it is accepted, of course, no problem, because we have that in district council election, we have that in LegCo election, so if, if you have that in a CE election, it's fine. But even if you confine the electoral process to the nominating committee, we can discuss it. And as I said earlier, widen the franchise, lower the threshold, and you cannot limit the number of candidates. But if you just concentrate on widening the franchise for the nominating committee and not address the question of the threshold, the 51%, and the two to three uh, limit the maximum number of candidates, I think you cannot come up with a proposal that would give the people genuine choice. So I, I hope you understand that. And, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, in the last 18 months or whatever, uh, there has not been that much attention, focus on uh, democratizing the nominating committee. And um, some people, particularly the students, and they keep pressing on civil nomination, which is something totally understandable. Uh, now Taiwan's going to do it again because uh, they're having their presidential election next year and then uh, there are independent candidates, Xi Ming Duck, and he's going to go out and collect half a million uh, signatures. So it's something that happens. So people want it and the press zero in on it. But that does not mean that there are other things on the table. But that was not addressed. But anyway, I don't think Beijing will allow it. They will not allow uh, you know, us to have a system whereby uh, candidates which are not acceptable to them will have a chance of standing for election. And that goes to uh, Mr. Somerville's question. He thinks that if we juggle with the uh, nominating committee composition, we can meet Beijing's uh, anxiety or demand. Actually, there is a mechanism in the basic law already, Article 45. It says Beijing appoints the chief executive. So even if a person wins the election by one person, one vote, the person does not become chief executive until he or she is appointed by Beijing. 
So Beijing has the final say, and my party accepts that that is a substantive power. But Beijing said that is not good enough because they say, oh, if you, if you elect someone that I don't like and I refuse to appoint, there will be a constitutional crisis, which could be true. They say, how can I exercise that? So I want to have the power to nominate the candidates <laughs> that I like so that whatever result that is of the election, I can live with it. But how can we have that? So I hope you understand that we did try, but they, were fought, they just fell on the wayside, and now we are stuck with this horrible situation. Well, I, you know, first of all, uh, whether the package will be passed by one vote or by 10 votes or 20 votes doesn't make any difference. We have to respect the outcome. Uh, again, democracy, what's behind it is respect of everybody. That's the outcome. And we should respect the law. What makes Hong Kong um, what it is today is our respect to our law. This is our present law. Before it's changed, we have to respect what we have. We can't say that uh, if we tell people, you vote against it, I'm going to surround, let's go, I'm going to do this and do that. That's not the respect of law, and that is right against uh, democracy. And it is wrong, especially when it comes from the mouth of people that are in the legal profession. I, I agree um, with Mr. Somerville and Professor Lee. It is is um, geographic more democratic? I, I don't agree. Okay, you may not agree with me, but I think the, the, uh, um, geographic um, election is more populist. We can s I, I see it from other countries. You you want to get popular vote? You give away more. Uh, so we we have to look at Hong Kong as a special administrative region. What is good for Hong Kong? Uh, how we can maintain a good relation with the people of Hong Kong as well as with the people of China and the government. You know, we have to consider all this. Uh, the last question, of course I see what China is doing. One country, two system, what they do and what we do, we should not, we, we don't have to follow what they do. If we, if we follow that, then we should let Beijing appoint our chief executive. Like what, what they are doing in China. It's an well, election. It's a village election. They're asking us to accept the giant village election. Please well, respond to the question. Again, if we follow what they do in China, okay, we can follow everything. Well, uh, can I start by saying that I, I, I didn't realize I have so many fans in the audience today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the names of the, of the speakers, so can I just refer to, to, to you by, by reference of the order of the question that, which were uh, made. Uh, in answer to the first question, um, nothing wrong with functional constituencies. I totally agree. What is wrong is that in Hong Kong, the functional constituencies are being monopolized by limited companies and by a very limited number of voting members of various organizations. Uh, and uh, in the labor uh, union sector, they were being monopolized by union leaders. Uh, if the functional constituencies were to be elected by general franchise of the people in those uh, constituencies, then I totally agree there's no, there's no reason why we should differentiate. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, I, I didn't realize you were a fan of mine because you know, I raised this two years ago. I was the only one, I think I'm still the only one, who spent time working on the existing functional constituencies in the election committee, one by one, sitting down, looking at the numbers, working out which can be uh, 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 democratized. 
And I heard Emily said there was no discussion. This is, this is the sad thing about it. There were a lot of open discussions at the time when I raised the, the, the proposal, but the Democrats wouldn't have it, wouldn't support it. Even my, even my party doesn't support it. So when I speak to Beijing officials, and they say, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, don't go any further. How many votes have you got? I said, well, one. He said, no, you don't even have one, because your vote belongs to the civic party, and the civic party doesn't support it. So let's move on. Let's look at things which the pandemics want. That's very sad, very sad, even up to now. You know, if you take out my proposal, even now, it's still workable. But still, the pandemics wouldn't have it. Now, uh, the last question, again, I mean, I didn't realize you're a fan of mine. Because I said exactly that nine months ago. I said exactly just that. I said, look, I realize that Beijing says that election of chief executive is about sovereign power and national security. And I said, look, I'm just a poor nobody. I'm just a barrister. I can't deal with national sovereignty or national security. So if you say, if you say that's what it's all about, and I said, okay, I forget about it, but let's have universal suffrage for let's call. Because we have, we have two aims, all them, uh, and Democrats have two aims. One is universal suffrage for the chief executive, and the other is universal suffrage for let's call. Well, let's have that as a condition for accepting the package. And you know what? The answer is the same. He said, wait a minute, Ronnie, sorry, not Ronnie. Wait a minute, Hong Chia how many watts have you got? One? No, the Pandemocrats wouldn't have it. The Pandemocrats wouldn't have it even today. They said, no, there's no way we would take the 31st of August package, even if you promise to abolish functional constituencies. So we are completely and utterly and hopelessly stuck. It is not for want of ideas. I wouldn't say good ideas, I just say want of ideas. It's want of willingness to compromise, to take what you can get and fight for another day. Well, sadly, we're almost out of time, so I think we should probably wrap up here. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists. Um, three very different views on what's happening in Hong Kong and the uh, upcoming vote. And I hope if many of you have questions, you can come up and speak with them afterwards. But please join me in thanking them for speaking with us.